This is the Crowd Crux Crowdfunding Podcast with, with Sal, Sal Brigman, where we cover everything you need to know to, to launch, launch a successful, successful crowdfunding, crowdfunding campaign. campaign. We speak with proven entrepreneurs who've raised money from the crowd and want to teach you how to do the same. Stay tuned because we're about to reveal how to launch your dream project with your host, Sal Brigman. Before we get started with this podcast episode, I want to take a second to introduce you to my friends at FulfillRight. If you need help shipping out your Kickstarter or Indiegogo perks or rewards, FulfillRight is the absolute best company for you. I've been working with them for a while and I can vouch for their services. They make it dead simple and take all of the headache out of shipping out all of those boxes, all of those orders to your backers and your customers. If you want to check them out, go to fulfillright.com at F-U-L-F-I-L-L-R-I-T-E.com. What up, what up? Salvador Brigman here with the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast, and I have a very special interview today. I brought on the CEO of Free Range Studios, Jonas X. And I actually heard about Jonah. I was in Barnes & Noble. You know, I love to visit Barnes & Noble and just like browse around, see the different books that are coming out, etc. I picked up his book, Winning the Story Wars, Why Those Who Tell and Live the Best Stories Will Rule the Future. And if you've been studying marketing at all or you've been studying business, you know, you've been picking up business books, you'll know that there are a lot of business books out there that really kind of just regurgitate a lot of commonly held notions. You know, you want to read, you read one, you've read them all. But Jonah's book was completely different. I honestly think I'm going to look back on this book as one of the seminal pieces in my own marketing career. I learned a ton from this book on the concept of story. And story can be very esoteric, can be very sort of, I guess, high-minded. You know, these are people that are talking about emotions and are talking about characters and that kind of stuff. How is that applicable to business? Well, as you're about to learn, many of the companies that are making lots and lots of money out there selling products, and also many of the crowdfunding campaigns that are successfully raising money are doing it because they're selling a product under the guise of a story. You can use a story as an information vehicle to get messages and to get products to spread around the world. It is really cool. And honestly, there is no one else out there that I think is the expert in this topic. Jonah, not only has he been featured on the New York Times, NPR, Fast Company Magazine, which actually named him one of the 50 most influential social innovators, he's also had his work take top honors three times at South by Southwest's Interactive Festival. And finally, he has a really great TED Talk out there if you want to watch that. Winning the Story Wars, um, which is also the title of his book published by the Harvard Business Review. So this entire episode is going to go into story and how you can apply that to your Kickstarter or Indiegogo campaign, or if you're more of doing an e-commerce business, how you can apply it to that. I think you're going to like it a lot. Before we get into it, just really quickly, I have a question for you guys. I'm really curious, what type of content do you want to see more of on this podcast? You know, we've produced over 150 episodes. I think we've covered a lot of different topics, but I'm always curious and always looking to get feedback on the podcast. Hit me up on Twitter. My personal Twitter is at S Brigman, S B R I G G M A N. And let me know what topic you'd like to see covered more on this podcast or what topic you'd like to have me cover more in my YouTube videos, on the blog, etc. Without further ado, let's get into today's podcast episode. Jonah, welcome to the podcast. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. And you said last week we were supposed to do the podcast, but you had a writer's retreat? Yeah, I'm writing a new book. It's called Unsafe Thinking, and it's uh, due out in January, and I am uh, got it due to the press in two weeks. So uh, yeah, in the last phases of writing my next book. Is that like you go to a cabin, like totally secluded, like Stephen King style? Like, how, how do you do that? You know, it actually was. I was in a cabin in the woods for <laughs> five days, did not see another soul, wrote a lot of words, and uh, went a little crazy. So it was pretty good. There's a movie about that, Rear Window, with uh, Johnny Depp. <laughs> Have you seen that? 
I have heard of it, but I have not seen it. Oh, you got uh, you got to watch that one. <laughs> I will. Cool, man. Um, well, I've really been waiting to have you on this podcast. I think you have a lot of amazing insights from your last book, Winning the Story Wars, um, Why Those Who Tell and Live the Best Stories Will Rule the Future. And I first wanted to ask you, how long did it actually take you to put together this first book? The first book was really, um, you know, it was one of those pieces where I think I was 35 when I wrote it, and I felt like it took 35 years of uh, telling stories and being involved with stories to put that actual information together. And I think with your first uh, creative effort in a new field, you get to write about the things that you have collected over a lifetime that you most love. So um, the actual project took about a year and a half to pull together, but really did come from about uh, 10 years of online marketing and storytelling, uh, viral storytelling, and then of course, just my lifelong passion for stories. But, but with marketing, there are so many different subjects that you can choose to write about. Why was it that story sort of gravitated to like the top of your mind there? You know, back in 1999, when I started this thing, uh, started my company, Free Range Studios, I was exploring how people could share the ideas they were most passionate about on the, you know, the new thing called the Internet it wouldn't be broadcasters would be telling you what to watch or hear anymore. You'd be getting to decide. And I was like, what's going to make people most likely to share an idea? And I played with lots of different things. We made these early viral movies. Um, some of them would be hugely successful and some of them would be funnier, better designed, better sound effects than the, the, the more successful movies, but they would fail. And, you know, whether it was about blood diamonds in Africa or factory farming, we were making all these different interesting films. But <clears throat> to my surprise, I discovered that the ones that really worked were the ones that were more like fairy tales, that were kind of telling stories that people could really understand and resonate with. And it didn't really matter how funny or clever or smart or cool you looked. It really just mattered did you hit that note of story storytelling. Mm -hmm. and so what, I started kind of looking into that and realized that that's the way human beings have always communicated. I think that actually just you think of someone who's really young, like someone who's like five years old, and they're yeah. they're not paying attention to anything. They have ADD, but when you turn on a movie or you turn on the TV, like instantly their attention is just glued to the screen, and they're curious about all these different characters and what happened, etc. Why do you think that just grabs our attention in such a powerful way? Yeah, well. We are coded genetically to seek out and listen to stories, especially as children. Stories are the way that a tribe of people will tell each other what's important, what's not important, what happens if you act this way, what happens if you steal this thing. It's a kind of reality simulator. It teaches you how the world works. And children are really programmed to sit on each other's, you know, to sit on elders' knees and say, tell me a story. You know, they'll ask, <coughs> excuse me, they'll ask for 100 stories a day if you'll tell them, and they'll want to hear them again and again. This is how they're preparing to understand the world. I've actually seen some interesting research that said that old people tend to repeat themselves quite a bit. Um, and that may be genetically as well because young people, like little kids, need to hear the same stories again and again. So I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, it's really in our DNA to want to hear stories and not just sort of random facts and figures and ideas. We want to hear them encoded in the real world. And that's how stories work. For me, also, I'm one of those person who's guilty of rewatching the same movie. Like a certain amount of time will pass, and I'll just like rewatch the movie because I knew it was good the first time, but like I forgot enough to not fully put together the entire story. So I'm also guilty of that. <laughs> well, you might have a five year old mindset. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe I think it just sort of cut, you know cuts to the fact that we need things that are emotionally engaging. And a lot of the times, you know, you come from a very intelligent background, you know, I come from a, a schooling background, etc. We're taught that you just need to talk about statistics and really use very powerful language, um, you know, very uppity kind of vocabulary. But it doesn't seem what actually gets people engaged or gets people to read and take action on things. It's more like an emotional sort of component. Yeah, you know, we lived in a time uh, for many, many years where information was kind of like gold. You know, if you had information, you really um, had power. A map could be worth, you know, more than a castle if it showed you the outlines of a new territory. Now information is completely ubiquitous. Anyone can have access to almost anything they want to know. And the idea is not sort of like who knows more. Um, the idea is who can make sense of the world for me in a way that, that connects with me. And so... Um, 
yeah, it doesn't really help to be an expert anymore and to claim expertise for a whole number of reasons, especially that people don't really trust uh, in claims like they used to. It used to be that if you had enough money to buy a billboard or a radio ad, you could get on there and tell people what to think. And those people would be like, well, I don't have enough money for a radio ad. This guy must be more successful than me. He must know what he's talking about. Now everyone's got the megaphone. So the question is not who's going to scream the loudest, who's going to say the most convincing thing, who's, who's going to share the biggest idea. It's like, who's going to connect with me and make me say, oh, yeah, I want to be part of that thing. I'm, that, that's my tribe. That's my mm. way of thinking. And that comes you know, not from facts, figures, statistics, claims, but from telling great stories. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's really sort of, I guess, cutting through the noise. And one of the things that I think the listeners might not know is I actually, at one point when I was in college, was thinking of being a fiction major. Like I was thinking of doing that for a living. And someone said, so you planning not to make any money? You know, this sort of joke there that people who are good at storytelling or are good in the arts, whether it's writing, you know, books, whether it's oral storytelling or even, you know, short indie films, that they don't tend to make a lot of money. But on the flip side, you have marketers that are using those same techniques to sell products. That, that's really interesting to me. And how did then, I guess, you stumble into the fact that you can use stories to sell product? You know, I think I, the, the kind of products that I was selling early in my career were really ideas. You know, how do we stop the trade for um, illegal minerals? How do we get people to care more about the environment? How do we get people to buy more sustainable products? And... Um, you know, those ideas are not easy to sell. They, they take people out of there every day. They take people out of their kind of lizard brain desire for just more, more, more and to, to be selfish for themselves. You got to tap on some into those higher level kind of values. And, um, you know, I, again, I just discovered that you could yell at people all you, all you want. You could try to convince them all you want. But if you sucked them into a story in the same way that you're, you're talking about, you know, you, the minute you turn on the piece of communication, if you see a character doing something and you don't know what that character is about to do and you're wondering what's going to happen to that guy, uh, that's a totally different thing than turning it on and suddenly here comes someone telling you what to think. It's completely different. So, you know, throughout history, we didn't just get up there and say, uh, better safe than sorry and yell better safe than sorry to all the children. No one, no one really cares about that. But you tell a story about what happens to a kid who doesn't prepare and goes out into the wood, woods and get eaten by a lion and suddenly all the kids are listening and they're riveted and now they're taking that lesson for themselves. So yeah, I think that if you want to sell um, anything, whether it's an idea, whether it's a product, whether it's a new system of values for the world, um, you better figure out how to encode it in a story if you want people to to give you the time of day. Because again, nobody really needs your ad or social media post or uh, crowdfunding uh, campaign. They want less, not more. So unless you're offering something that a value to them, uh, you're not going to get heard. It really sort of resonated with me when you broke down that there are sort of two types of stories. You know, one of them sort of appeals to more of inadequacy and things that we feel like we need. And they sort of, it sort of dials into those emotions that we all have and needs as a human being. And then there are more empowerment based stories. So I'd love it if you could just share a little bit the, the dichotomy here and just go into these two different types of stories. Sure. So, you know, maybe 60 years ago, marketers started realizing way before the internet, they started realizing that you could do sell more products if you told stories. And so we started seeing ads come out, like the original Listerine ad, which basically showed a, a 29-year-old woman who was not married, her name is Sad Edna, and why she has bad breath and she doesn't know it. And so you know, the fear that that instilled in women reading these magazines that saw Sad Edna not married because she had bad breath built this multi-billion dollar industry um, for Listerine. And the idea of that kind of marketing had always been Basically, you are the damsel in distress, the world is a dangerous place, and the hero of the stories that we're telling is this brand. So if you buy this Cadillac, if you smoke these Marlboros, if you use this Listerine, if you get this house, if you get uh, the right kind of hair, you're going to be okay. But the world is kind of a scary place and you're going to be laughed at. You're not going to be good enough. You're not going to get what you want, whether it's marriage or the right job, if you don't have the right clothes, the right stuff. And so that was enormously effective to basically make the brand the hero of the story and make the consumer um, the, the, the damsel in distress and threaten people, basically. And <clears throat> that was enormously successful through the broadcast era. But the change that's happened is 
you know, imagine someone reading that magazine ad about this woman with bad breath. Well, what are they going to do about it? They don't have anyone to talk to about it. They don't, they just see it and they get scared and they want to do something. But now imagine trying to share an ad like that on Twitter with all your friends or on Facebook. Imagine accusing all your friends of having bad breath. Are you going to build social capital that way? Are you going to be successful and liked online if you're telling your fr- your friends how much they suck and how much they need this product to be cool? Like that, that doesn't work anymore in the same way. So what I'm saying with empowerment marketing is instead of appealing to people's sense of insecurity, their fear, uh, maybe their greed, their desire to kind of have it all so that they can be safe in the world – um, empowerment marketing is really about making the audience member the hero of the story and talking not about how great you are, but about how great they can be through a relationship with you. You know, you're going to help them reach their full potential. Do you think um, that just out of curiosity, do you think that these two can support each other in any way? And to give you an example here, so there are books out there like the four hour work week. And that sort of title immediately makes you think, oh, I don't have to work at all. It appeals to that desire to you know, have money, et cetera, more of the sort of primal nature, et cetera. But then that book kind of brings you more into an empowerment mindset of this lifestyle that you're creating. So do you think you can use one of these to sort of capture attention and then use the empowerment uh, model, I guess, to really help your customers, et cetera? Yeah, I mean – you know, the, the four hour work week is an interesting example because in a way it is empowerment, right? It's like, you know, not why you need to work harder just to get by. It's why you actually, you know, you can, you've got the smarts to, to hack the system. So in some ways that message is an empowerment message, but yeah, it also does speak to some ways a materialistic message. But, but I find that even something like the four hour work week, um, or, you know, all current thinking about how to communicate with people about meeting their goals it's going to talk to you about finding your deepest purpose, right? You, you can't write a book anymore about how to become a millionaire um, and take yourself that seriously. You, you write a book about, you know, how maybe you get successful so that you can live your life's deepest purpose. And that's, you know, just part of the, the culture that we live in now and even part of what um, Tim Ferriss is trying to get people to do is, you know, not just chase as much stuff as you can chase, but, but, but find some reason for being. And so um, – you know, what I talk about in the book is that the early marketing was really based on some Freudian ideas that like people are only driven by fear, greed, um, anger, that kind of thing. And, and, you know, this Maslow came along after Freud and said, yeah, people are driven by those things, but they're also driven by this desire to be part of a community, by the desire for justice and truth and creativity. And these higher level values are actually more inspiring. So I think even if you're going to write a book about how to get rich quick, you know, it's going to be a more inspiring book if you're talking about how to get rich quick so that you can be more in service to the world. And we're, we're living in a world now where that, that kind of thing resonates quite a bit more. Very interesting. One of the things that I certainly noticed when I started to w- learn way more about marketing and even your book with storytelling, I started to look into my past and examine the stories that sort of affected my life and my view of the world, whether it was movies, you know, your young guy like Wall Street or movies like Scarface, etc. They give you a sort of an idea of like machismo and your mm. view of the world. Did any stories impact you specifically in your younger years or that sort of led your career? I had to interrupt this podcast episode because I want to introduce you to my friends at The Gadget Flow. Their product discovery platform reaches 22 million people per month. They've helped more than 5,000 crowdfunding campaigns thus far, and they have a social media following of more than 700,000 followers. If you want to gain access to their marketplace and list your own product, you can go to thegadgetflow.com slash submit and list your project today. Yeah, you know, um, certainly when I was a, a kid, a uh, little kid, you know, things like Where the Wild Things Are, this book, Ira Sleeps Over, just about little kids setting out on you know, big adventures where whether it's just the big adventure of going next door to not be afraid to sleep at your friend's house or sailing off in a ship to tame the monsters, you know, uh, these, I, these books that made you feel like, yeah, I'm small, but I can be big, um, were really important for growing up. And then, you know, then it's, it's a small leap, you know, you start watching Star Wars. And of course, this is much grander than a, a little kid's book, but it's, it's the same story, right? It's about a regular person who does something extraordinary. Um, 
And, you know, Luke Skywalker is this kind of whiny little teenage orphan. Um, he's not the guy who you think is going to save the universe but or the galaxy, but but he does. And then you watch a, a movie like that, uh, which, of course, I did many, many times when I was a kid. And um, you start to believe like, OK, you know, I'm just a little schmo over here in my little in my little town in the middle of nowhere. But, um, you know, maybe I might achieve something great in the world. Maybe I might have something to offer. You know, I'm not going to blow up the Death Star, but maybe I'll I'll do something great. And so those kind of things really had a big impact on me. And I, I found really interesting about that is that the stories, you know, you mentioned something like Wall Street, of course, powerful movie, powerful story. But the stories that people really love to share and have throughout history, and which is why I talk about the hero's journey quite a bit in the book, is people love to share stories about ordinary people doing extraordinary things and those extraordinary things not necessarily making them rich and famous, but making them better citizens, making the world a better place. And so when we think, oh, it's so hard to get people to care about the world, um, actually the stories that we tell are always about some unlikely hero um, contributing something big to a better world. So I, I think there's some inspiration in that. Even Lord of the Rings, you know, one of the huge, obviously massive successes is just about an ordinary person, an ordinary group of friends even, who don't, yeah. aren't special in any way, and they're going up against these massive monsters and forces of darkness, etc. That's just another example of that. So if I, yeah. if, I, if I was listening to this podcast, like I'm getting a ton of information about storytelling, about characters, like all this kind of stuff, I want to sort of bring this into more of a practical level in terms of if someone is putting together a pitch video or they're putting together their campaign page, do you have any tips or ways that they can incorporate some of these elements into this pitch? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is, um, you know, I think an awful lot of attention is put on, you know, we, we put 90% of the communication on here's what I'm trying to do, right? Here's what I'm trying to make. And what I'm trying to achieve now, here's what you can do, which is, you know, support it. <laughs> and, you know, in this model that I'm talking about, it's like, let's really think through our audience's eyes, right? What are they trying to do? What are they trying to achieve? And how does this, <clears throat> how does this invitation um, help them do that better? And if you can really think about that uh, and flip that on its head so that you're not the genius hero of the story that you're trying to tell, but they are uh, the people you're trying to reach uh, I think that's an important change, you know, really having a sense of empathy and understanding for your audience and why they would care about this at all uh, is one. You know, two, I would say challenge yourself. You know, when you're a, when you're a journalist, your editor is always going to tell you, you know, show, don't tell. It's not OK to just go out there and tell the audience what you think. You need to show what that looks like on the ground in real people's lives. So tell a story, right? You know, show your product in the hands of people and and what does it look like what does it feel like um what what world larger world is this part of so you know don't just show off the ideas or the product you know make it as real as possible and in a lot of campaigns the thing is not completely real yet but but imagine it that gives you a chance to, to do imagination and and take it to an imaginative place um third you know one thing that i think is really interesting about marketing stories is that you know a movie, a real story, like a true entertainment story, you often don't know where it's going to go, right? You, you, you start out, but, but it doesn't go in obvious directions. So many marketing stories, though, start at point A, and you know you're going to point B. You know, a person has a problem, a person solves the problem, the end. But um, can the best marketing stories actually bring in some of that tension, some of that unexpectedness, some of that delight? as if it were a real story. And I think that's one of the hardest uh, hurdles to get over. But if you can say, hey, this is going to be unpredictable, it's going to be edgy, it's going to make people laugh, it's going to make people uh, feel like watching that was uh, a bit of entertainment, um, that, that's helpful. And so, you know, that might mean collaborating with a, with a professional storyteller. It might mean, uh, you know, in my early days, I just spoofed a lot of the stories that I loved. You know, I spoofed Star Wars, I spoofed The Matrix. Um, so, you know, kind of pulling from real stories, holding it to that standard of true storytelling, not just marketing speak, is really helpful. So taking for, let's just take the Lord of the Rings uh, storyline for an example. So in terms of the actual customer, I guess that then is always going to be the hero undergoing this journey, trying to achieve something or trying to have some sort of result in the world. And then from what I understand, there is then a mentor that could be like Gan Gandalf in Lord of the Rings, someone who's sort of helping the hero along this journey. 
and then they're giving them some kind of an item or they're giving them something to help them accomplish this quest. Is that item then the product? Like with the marketer, is this the product that people are trying to buy or where would you say the actual product is in that sort of model? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends. I think if, if the product itself is actually magical, you know, it's something that's not, you know, I talk about, I talk about this magic gift, right? So whether it's a lightsaber or ruby red, slippers or magic staff or something, you know, your brand should play the role of the mentor. Think of yourself more like Yoda or Obi-Wan Kenobi than like Luke Skywalker. And you're inviting someone onto an exciting journey, but you're not going to take the journey they are. You're going to hand them this magic gift. Now, if the product itself is truly, truly magical, like, wow, I've never seen something like that before. Um, you know, maybe that is the gift that makes the, the journey possible. I think, you know, you take a brand more like Nike or something where they're just making shoes. And so the shoes themselves don't actually make your journey possible, but it's like the feeling that it gives you. So, you know, the magic gift might be this, this sense that, um, you know, what's really inside of you already is the power that you need. So this access to your own power, it can be a physical thing or it can be more of an idea that you're giving them. But, um, yeah, think about how your product kind of makes a hero out of, out of your customers. Um, and how you can have that sort of cool mentor relationship with them where you're not ordering them to do something, but you're inviting them on an exciting journey. Do you ever see any tangible examples of villains in these stories? I mean, taking like the Nike example, do you see villain maybe being this other life that you could choose of, you know, sitting in front of the TV on your sofa and, you know, putting on more pounds? Or do you ever see a villain in these different stories? Yeah, you know, I think... There's a couple of things like, you know, once sometimes the villain, some famous advertising, we don't have to go into them all, but, you know, the villain is kind of the competition, right? The, 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 the other brand, right? Or the old way of doing things. Um, sometimes the villain can be uh, someone who represents a, um, a broken cultural attitude. So if you have a brand that's really built about women's empowerment, you can up your story and make it really fun by having some, you know, really, uh, retroactively thinking dude who's sexist in and and kind of the the hero overcomes you know that sexist attitude so sometimes we can embody uh the villain with broken cultural attitudes and sometimes the villain like you're saying is uh and this goes deep into some of the mythology stuff that i study but often the villain is who we who we would become if we indulged our deepest darkest um you know, side, if we didn't take the journey, if we didn't, um, become our best. So that's why, you know, when you put on the, when Frodo puts on the ring, he turns evil. The bad guy is often, you know, our unrealized potential. So the, the, the guy sitting on the couch, uh, not watching TV instead of going out and live, living his best life is a sort of that kind of villain. So there's, there's opportunities and, you know, obviously in marketing stories, it, it's fun to have a little fun with the villain. You know, if you're really going all out to this like evil, uh, bad guy against you, that's going to probably come across as kind of campy. So I would say probably have a little bit more fun with it than trying to be too serious. But, you know, you can watch the original 1984 ad from Apple. And that's about, you know, the villain is, is the monoculture of IBM. And that's still the most powerful television commercial of all time. What I love about that is it almost seems like the hero and the villain are the same person. They just kind of made different life choices in some ways. You know, they just kind of went down that different path. And maybe if they hadn't succumbed to those things and had tried to rise above them, they would have been the hero. Uh, that's yeah. really interesting to me. Well, right. I mean, I mean, Darth Vader was, right? He was a great Jedi who succumbed to his, to his inner urges of anger and hate. So, yeah, definitely. I was reading this story also. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Top Gun. Um, mm -hmm. But this movie, you know, you have Maverick, this like hot rod pilot guy. And uh, when this movie came out, all of a sudden, one of the products he wore, his sunglasses, the sales of those sunglasses like skyrocketed and no one could understand why. And it was because people want to feel like him. They want to sort of live a part of that story by owning that product that he wore. And I just thought yep. that was fascinating. Yeah. No, I mean, it's been a <clears throat> it's been a long, long time since we began this process of you know, building our identities around the products that we wear, <laughs> that we wear and consume. Um, that's a language that we speak in this culture and have, uh, for about a hundred years now where, you know, uh, a bag of potato chips is not a bag of potato chips. It, it's, it's a marker of, you know, the kind of person that you are. And we, we, not only do we know how to sort of display it, but we all know how to read it very quickly too. You know, I could, I can name a brand and you could instantly tell me 
the same answer as you know any other person I could ask. You know, what does this mean about that person? So it's a language that we're all very fluent in, and new brands are always struggling to kind of like get into that conversation. One of the most like just really mind blowing things, having started my blog, the podcast, YouTube, etc. Every once in a while, I have people reach out to me saying that they have the sense that they know me. Like that, the fact that we've never met in person, that they feel like they know me and they have a sense of my values and the different stories that I myself have told on the podcast over the years. Um, where do you think then, if you are putting out this story, I think like an archaic, I guess, model of marketing is, oh yeah, we've been in business for like 40 years and we, we're the best and like we have all of these awards and accommodations, but that kind of puts you at a distance from your customers. It yeah. kind of it makes it harder to relate with you. How can people make a character or their brand more relatable with with these story techniques we're talking about? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. You know, like the, it's like who's the storyteller, right? So in the old days of the podcast era, you could get on the radio, and there was like there was a kind of voice of God, you know, that we would just would tell us what to do, and um, you know that doesn't that doesn't work anymore. People do expect. Uh, you know, even to get their news from an opinionated source, they expect to hear um, who's the person behind the brand. And so I think there's lots of ways to do it. You know, one of the things that we often talk about is, you know, archetyping. I write about it in the book. So ask yourself if your brand was a human being, a single human being, what kind of person would that would that human being be? And really try to embody the when you write, when you speak, when you when you create, embody, embody that person's voice. And so you know, if you're a joker, then then be funny, you know, and if you're a rebel, then really try to be the kind of rebel that people would want to live up to and, and see what, what you're fighting against and embody that voice because speaking in a dispassionate um, voice above your audiences really does not, does not work anymore. And sometimes it is about, you know, exposing yourself a little bit more. I think people forget to do that. Like you could build your media properties without your unique voice and story. And a lot of people do that and it's less successful, but because you're exposing something of yourself, people feel like they know you, um, that, that really increases people's engagement. They want, people want to have relationships with other people, not with, you know, faceless organizations. These are some just amazing insights. Like these are nuggets of gold. Um, I know that when I've personally been, you know, writing books and all these different things, I've always had a chapter that sort of stood out to me when I was writing it. I'm just kind of curious when you were writing this book, did you have any chapters that to you were like your favorite or you felt like you learned just a lot writing it yourself or you, I don't know. I'm just kind of curious there. I'm speaking to the crowdfunders in the audience who have already launched a Kickstarter campaign or have actually even successfully run a campaign. And the reason is, I think you will understand this pain point most. And that is, when you finally do raise money on Kickstarter or Indiegogo, the hardest part is not collecting the cash. The hardest part is shipping out all of those perks and rewards to your backers. It is a nightmare, my friends. It's a lot of spreadsheets, it's a lot of headache, and it's a lot of stress. That's why I recommend BackerKit. If you have not heard of BackerKit, they help you collect surveys, they help you collect data, and the entire fulfillment process is just so much easier and so many less spreadsheets when you use their software. You can check them out at BackerKit.com and use CrowdCrux for a special discount. Yeah, um, you know, the first half of the book is really about the history of marketing and advertising in a lot of ways and the moment we find ourselves in right now. And um, the one that I probably struggled with the most but I found most fruitful for me was this idea of, you know, our myths, our traditional myths broke down and no society ever lived without myths. And then marketers have become our modern day myth makers and really showing how that works and showing how why myths kind of lead people to act the way they do and identify the way they do. That whole history and anthropology, that deep dive into some of the theory, um, it's not the most actionable part of the book really, but I think it's kind of, for me, was the most mind shifting. Second half of the book is really about how you you know, use these ideas to change your marketing and, um, you know, really, really enjoyed and loved kind of writing, writing that part too, just because it brought together so much of what I learned, but never quite, you know, formalized before. 
awesome. I think this book is honestly just going to be a pillar. I can look back on this thing, having read it, I look at the future trajectory of my own career and say that it's changed a lot because of this. And I think I'll, I mean, so many of the techniques that you talk about are just amazing, um, applying them to marketing and also just understanding the society we live in. Um, so yeah. I'll be sure to link it up in the show notes. I'm not sure if you want to talk about your new book at all when that's coming out or where people can check that out, but I'll, I guess I'll sure. give you the opportunity here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, the new book is called Unsafe Thinking, How to Be Nimble and Bold When You Need It Most. Um, it's going to be coming out early uh, 2018, which once sounded like forever, but now is coming up on us. Um, and it's about how when the ways that we're doing things are no longer working and we realize it, how do we actually change? How do we actually try more new creative approaches? How do we innovate? And, um, you know, our brains kind of work against us in a lot of ways. Doesn't We don't like to find new patterns. We like to stick with what we know. But how do you actually train your brain to be open, to be uh, take risks, to think in new ways? Um, and so how do, we, how do you pull that off in, in, in ways that are unexpected and retrain yourself to be more innovative? That's what I'm looking into right now. I think that's really salient too, because the world is changing so much that you almost have to you have to force yourself to to adopt all of these new different social media networks to adapt new apps, et cetera. And I don't know how people are familiar with this, but like the reticular activation system in your brain will focus on different things, and you sometimes might not just notice opportunities. So I can see totally where that just will retrain your thinking and mindset to be able to identify some new business opportunities. So I'm looking forward yeah. to that one. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, a, a constantly changing and information flooded world um, does in many ways cause us to sort of restrict our focus. We have to. It's a natural response to protect ourselves. Um, and it's anxiety provoking to live in a world of constant change, but it's obviously opportunity generating as well. So how do we deal with the anxiety, uh, seize the opportunities and become more more joyful in, in how we create? Nice. Well, this book was incredibly perceptive. Um, kudos. I'm going to definitely link it up. Everyone can check it out. Also, be sure to leave an Amazon review. Jonah, thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing some of your insights. I'm going to give you the last word here. If you want to give a, a last tip or a word of encouragement to the listeners who are going out there trying to get their stories heard, I'd love it if you could just give a, a last word here. Sure. Well, let me just start by saying that um, you know you can go to jonasax.com. I forgot to say if you'd like to sign up uh, to get updates about the new book. And uh, now for an actual tip. Um, yeah, I would just say that creating a sense that your um, campaign is really a gift um, to your audiences as opposed to an obligation for them, you know, something that they're, they're going to find a reason to share because it just was so delighted, it delighted them. It surprised them. It taught them something new. If you, if you can aim for that, and even if you don't achieve it every time, that, that kind of aim is what opens up, you know, our storytelling muscles, makes us step out of um, talking so much about ourselves and, and really offering something to our audiences. And uh, it's a whole, whole lot more fun to communicate that way. And so hope uh, some of these ideas will empower you. And uh, Sal, thanks so much for having me on the show. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, man. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Crowdfunding Demystified Podcast. If it's your first time tuning in, again, my name is Salvador Brigman, and I have a really exciting announcement that I want to share with you. You don't even have to be necessarily interested in what I'm about to say, but just for me personally, as a blogger, you know, as a millennial, having built my business, this is something that's just a big deal in my own life. And my announcement is that my new audiobook, Nonprofit Crowdfunding Explained, which is available on Audible, is now live. And the reason it's a big announcement is I have never produced an audiobook before. This is the first time I've ever made an audiobook. And I had just a blast doing it. Honestly, it was a lot of editing, a lot of making sure that the audio quality was perfect, etc. But I loved every minute of it. I never saw myself when I was younger as a podcaster. I never saw myself as doing something like an audiobook. Honestly, I never even saw myself being on video. So to know now that I begin to sort of push outside of my comfort zone and I released my very first audiobook, um, to me, that just felt so cool. And also knowing that now people, if you're out there, you don't like to read a physical book. You know, you want to listen in the car or you want to listen while you're at the gym or even just commuting to work. You can now do that. My goal from the very beginning of starting my blog has always been to democratize the information out there when it comes to crowdfunding. 
I want this available to everyone. I want everyone to know the best practices for raising money with a crowdfunding campaign. And now you can do that if you're interested in nonprofit crowdfunding. If you want to check out the audiobook, you can go to crowdcrux.com slash nonprofit audio. That is C-R-O-W-D-C-R-U-X dot com slash nonprofit audio. And it's actually free if you get a three uh, a 30 day trial membership with Audible. Audible allows you to listen to one book every single month. It really cup- keeps you sort of up to date with your learning on business or marketing or whatever you're trying to learn. And it's a great way to also just breeze through books because you can control the setting on the app. So you can listen to the actual book at a faster rate, like 1.5x or even 2x. I can't comprehend where it's that fast, but maybe you can. Um, but that's a sort of a great way to make sure that you're always learning something. Even if you don't have the time to read a physical book, you can be listening to a book in the car, you can be listening to a book in a subway, and you can always be learning new things and apply them to your business. Thank you for checking that out if you do. And as always, thank you for joining me on this journey. My name is Salvador Brigman, and I'll see you next time.